Hey, Peter. Hey, Arn. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Doing awesome. Thank you very much for, for making the time and uh, for sharing for sharing the story of this very cool building. Uh, we're, we're sitting here in, in actually one of the, one of the classrooms. Of course. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that looks very familiar. That looks very familiar. So... <laughs> We're, we're on the we're on the third floor so which which i don't understand why the main floor is the second floor and the third floor is the second floor and the fourth it's, floor the it's a carlton floor. thing yeah the, the ground floor is level 200 and then yeah it's 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 a unique kind of uh numbering system <laughs> well without further ado i will turn my my laptop and camera around here um so you, got, right. so you can talk to the people you're talking to a little bit let's see if we can get excellent this crowd here hello everybody good to see you Want to say welcome to the building. I'm sorry I couldn't join you guys today. Um, just a few too many things that were that were happening. But I did want to share the story of, of the EDC building, the, the Engineering Design Center at, at Carleton University. And so first off, I wanted to, you know, just introduce myself. I'm Arn Sarega, an associate at uh, Diamond Schmidt Architects, um, and I was the uh, the project architect for, for this building. So I want to, to welcome you all um, and also to thank, you know, Peter and, and Glass Curtain for, for hosting this event. It's it's always, you know, a proud moment when when you know a building you've you've worked on for years is uh, is featured and and people from the industry come through to to see it and 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 are excited about it. So that's definitely a, a very big very big thank you to 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 Peter and and team for for organizing all this. Of course, Carlton for letting us us host uh, this event today. So without further ado, what I I really wanted to do today is kind of walk you through you know the the design of the building, the context, and the program. I believe you've. Uh, kind of gotten a chance to to get a, a bit of a peek at the building, but the the tour will will kind of happen after um, after the lunch session. So that way, I can kind of give you the you know the lay of the land, what what kind of happened over the course of both design and construction, and really how how we were able to uh, to make this building uh, a reality. So first of all, starting with the project context. So the Engineering Design Center, you know, this is the, the Carleton campus here, kind of a, a satellite 3D view. And so the Engineering Design Center is kind of really located in, in a central part of the campus, <laughs> but really sort of away from the main campus road. And so here, just to highlight, uh, Diamond Schmidt has, has two projects. Uh, we're joint venturing with, with KWC on both of them. Um, one is the Engineering Design Center, which is now, now complete. And there's the new student residence, which is now under construction. And uh, some of you may have actually driven by it uh, on your way to uh, to the project here. And so, you know, this is this is our site, and this is where where we were um, asked to 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 build this building. And it's uh, you know directly connected to the McKenzie Building, engineering building from the the 1960s. Uh, you know, a, a relatively mid-century vintage, and that that posed a lot of challenges in terms of construction detailing, logistics. Um, and making sure that we were really building a robust uh, thermal envelope the best that we could do, considering for the fact that really with the, the expanded configuration, 50% uh, of, our, of our building envelope is really connected to the McKenzie building. And so what you're seeing here is a highlight of where we started in, in 2019. So the, the project design started in 2019. And so really all, you know, the entire construction period happened through COVID. And so that was, that was a challenge in and of itself. But you know what, we we really made it through, and I think we we both in terms of schedule, in terms of cost, and and in terms of uh, what we were able to deliver, I think I think we did a really good job, uh, you know, working through and navigating. And that was between you know Carlton Ellis Don, who was the, the the construction manager on the project, and ourselves to you know work you know for for a large majority of the time remotely with with really kind of pinpoint sessions on site for for probably the first year of construction. So. Moving on from from this uh, from this image, I want to give you also the context of the the university master plan. And so here again, you're seeing our uh, our initial building scope uh, here highlighted in red, and and really the way that that Carleton is looking to transform the campus in this area. Library Road, uh, as you know, kind of wraps around uh, along the the west side and along the the north side, but it's really seen as as a bit of a back of back of campus space, and so. Our building is kind of the first one in the sequence of really turning uh, Library Road into more of a front of house space. Uh, there's the, the building you see there under uh, C6 
is is a future building that that is going to be constructed. It's going to be a, a an academic building uh, in front of the the residence building that's that's shown there as building number six. And there's going to be a pedestrian pathway. So you you know when you're outside, you probably saw that the landscape is quite a light touch uh, at the moment, and that's because this is kind of in mind of the the future rework that will be happening within the next you know few years. And so really, what we what we were planning on uh, as well is kind of this future context that that was going to be or is going to be built. So now again, taking us back a few years before before the the EDC was was built, this is actually the facade that we were going to be connecting to. And as you can see, it's it's really a back of house space. This is where where garbage was kept. There was also a, a storage uh, exterior storage facility for engineering uh, researchers and uh, academics. And so you know there's all kinds of all kinds of things in there. There was an airplane wing. There was all kinds of components that that they you know use for for testing and and are too large to keep in in their lab spaces. So that was all decanted by by Carlton before we were able to to build. And this is kind of looking north across Library Road. So obviously this is where that that future building will be built and where you know this this pedestrian pathway will will eventually connect. So kind of the the two sides of the building just kind of shown for for context here in terms of the project program. So this is, you know, primarily a, a engineering capstone project building. And so what that means is that the classroom spaces, what we what we call design rooms, and that was more kind of a strategy, because if you if you call something a classroom, that means that other uh, faculties are able to book it. And this building was really meant to be dedicated for engineering students uh, and engineering clubs and teams to have their their capstone project work here to have their design base here and to be able to meet and kind of work in here in, in this dedicated building. And so the area requirements were for, for 10 engineering design bays. Uh, those are both what you see on uh, level 200, which is the ground floor with the roll-up doors. Those are those are design bays there. And some of those uh, are, are, you know, the formula team, there's the concrete toboggan team, there's other automotive teams, but that also includes other spaces on, on level 300, the second level where, where you guys are right now. And that includes, uh, you know, there's electronics, there's the rocket, there's the rocket club, um, which we'll have some photos because we, we got some great photos with uh, with the, the team in there. And then breakout spaces, design rooms, one of which you, you are in, which are meant to be sort of reconfigurable classroom like spaces. And in all of that kind of transparency and reconfigurability as at its core. And then on the top floor, level 400, uh, administrative offices and academic offices. Um, so there's uh, 32 academic faculty offices, and then there's uh, a staff lounge. And then some of those offices over the course of, of design were turned into, there's an open office area, and there's also some spaces for, for administrative staff as well. And then, of course, meeting rooms, always important uh, for people to be able to, to get together and, and have conversations. So uh, an approximate total GFA of about 20, 2,400, almost 2,500 uh, square meters. And this is uh, just another another quick snapshot of, of our areas, kind of split between between levels. So going to be on that, kind of the, the, the technical stuff. We started design in, in June of 2019. And this is kind of looking at the initial scope of the building. And what you can see is that it's it's about a third smaller than, than what we ended up building, than the, the 2,500 square meters. And really what we were what we were looking at here was keeping the, the courtyard space along the, the east side of the building here. And our entry would have been along the east side of the building as well, uh, walking in through, through a vestibule into kind of a, a main atrium space. And this is this is the massing here. Uh, it was still three three floors at that point. And really looking at, you know, the ground level, which is very much kind of in keeping with what we've done now, although I'll I'll, I'll show you the the current plans because as you can probably tell, this is a little bit different um, than what we've what we finally built. But the main concept really being keeping the ground floor as open as possible and and having these design bays that opened up into the atrium. So that when there's events at the start of the school year or at the start of a semester, they can open up the building, they can have events, they can open up the, the overhead doors and people can come in and see what, what the engineering clubs and teams are doing. And that's also a big part of how the clubs and teams actually get people engaged because they come in, they see the work that's happening and they want to they wanna be part of these, these clubs and, and teams. So really the ground floor, keeping it quite open, quite transparent. 
um, but still having these, these design bays along the north. And then moving up to the second floor on level 300 here, you know, really kind of maintaining both a view down below. Um, so, so introducing the central atrium that would allow for daylight to come in because one of the challenges here is that really our main building face is along the north. And so, you know, there's not a lot of southern daylight that we can really get. So we thought, okay, why don't we bring in an atrium? Uh, glaze that over so that really over the course of the day, we can we can bring in a lot of daylighting sort of deeper into the floor plate. And another one of the strategies, you know, we worked with with Peter and his team with with glass curtain is also to have large windows along the perimeter, but very high performing windows. And so we're, we're able to kind of bring in a lot of daylight into what is a, a fairly rectangular building with in this, you know, in this early iteration with one of its faces completely blocked from from any daylighting. At this point, when before the building expanded, we still had all of our design. We, we didn't have this administrative and faculty office component. So we actually had design rooms and design bays going all the way up to, to the third floor. And this is this atrium concept, which, uh, which we thought was a really strong move. Having that feature stair uh, climbing up through the middle also meant that if there were events, if there were other speakers coming in or things like that, the atrium could actually be reprogrammed so that people could overlook down, um, they could sit on the stairs and, and they could have these kind of informal events in the atrium for uh, students and clubs and teams and, and those sorts of things. So then just kind of going quickly through the initial concept for the facade, again, here's that, that image around the uh, project massing, the early project massing. And really the idea was to have a robust material at the at the base level in the touch zone. And so that's where, where we introduced the, the white precast. And then up above, we want to have more of a soft reflective material to really kind of lighten up the, the building up above and introduce you know, a large amount of glazing and kind of also reflect what is the, the patterning of the existing McKenzie building to relate it back to sort of what we were connecting to and what, what this building was a part of. But what we actually did is we inverted the patterning on the McKenzie building. So the McKenzie has, you know, very, very narrow windows with these uh, more rectangular, almost squarish proportions of, of brick. And in our case, we wanted to flip that around and do the larger proportions of, of glazing with the smaller proportions of solid. And there's also this very, very strong horizontal banding at each level. And so we also carried that through in our patterning. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in in the presentation. And again, here, defining the, the vertical fenestration divisions and the horizontals, and really coming up with this concept uh, that, that you see even, even to this day. We had you know multiple other options, but this is really the one that everybody felt was the strongest. It kind of carried through the, the horizontal banding from the existing building, and then brought in this, this great rhythm of windows that was very regular worked with the structural grid and really provided something that was quite clean. It had a very, very simple rhythm without overwhelming uh, the existing building or, or trying to be uh, something that was too, uh, too different from the existing building while still being a, a relatively fresh and new, and new design. So March 2020 came around, and obviously we all know that that COVID came around uh, at that exact same time. But what happened for us really is that Carlton essentially looked at you know what what their classroom requirements were at the university and realized that uh, you know they they needed to hire a, a whole bunch of new uh, academics and they needed uh, office space for them. They needed uh, faculty faculty office space. And so this is where essentially that addition of 32 offices was added, an open office space, uh, as well as the requirement for, for meeting rooms and, and that entire component. And so this, this required us to kind of rethink the project, um, expand into that courtyard that we had previously been uh, been leaving as it was, and really uh, closing off that, that main entry point and then creating a, a new entry point within this building for both our building as well as, as well as the McKenzie building on this side. And so at that point, the building really became much more prominent on this, on this side. And so really what we, what we look to do is basically to go from this and expand all the way to, to the edge of the McKenzie building to the east. And so, you know, this was basically an addition of close to 50% to of the, the GFA that we were uh, previously planning for. It also meant an expanded landscape scope, uh, whereas previously we had been really keeping to that courtyard. Now we were kind of looking to, to expand into the front 
um, realizing that it was going to be redesigned in the near future, but um, it meant that that we would still kind of uh, take over a bit of the parking to provide benching and, and and landscaping for the occupants of the new building, as well as for, for the McKenzie building. We brought in a, a paratranspo stop at that point, um, because previously the paratranspo vehicles would actually come into the parking lot. So as part of this changeover, they would no longer be able to use the, the parking lot for, for turnaround reasons. So we put in a new paratranspo stop and we we introduced the the storage yard on the side as well and so this is you know a, a quick rendering of of what that initial concept looked like um and basically how we kind of uh took over this whole block so really the building did become much more prominent along the side and 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 much larger and we really look to introduce kind of a larger entryway here. And so here you see on, on the site plan, again, you know, larger zones dedicated to both uh, paired transpo to accessibility because Carlton's uh, accessibility count in this area was was a little bit low, if I recall correctly. So the thought was, you know what, why don't we, why don't we make most of them AODA type A and B? Um, and then Carlton can can obviously decide how to divvy those up if all of them need to be that type, but at least they're sized for for that. And so when we move into uh, into the interior of the building, we really start to think about okay, what is the the expression and what is the language of the of the interior? And so because we were building a, a steel building right next to a, a very heavy concrete building. We wanted to really use that as a showcase for the design. We realized, you know, the finishes had to be quite robust. They had to be pretty simple because this was a building, you know, that's going to get knocked about. You know, one of the one of the big things that we we talked about with the facilities people is that, you know, there's going to be things being carried in. You know, people are going to knock into the block walls and things like that. They want to be able to just repaint. They don't want too much drywall. They don't want too much uh, kind of soft finishes on the lower levels. So we thought, okay, what could really be a nice feature um, within this space while keeping everything else kind of muted and, and minimal? And that's the structure. And so the idea here was to really uh, have kind of this, this layering gradient of, of yellow tones. And I know we've all seen the, you know, one of the, one of the um, interesting aspects of it was that there's uh, on any university campus, you will see that the, the engineering sculpture, that's always there that kind of shows all the connections. And it's typically, you know, a, a very, very bright yellow. So we thought, okay, why don't we mute that yellow a little bit? But at the same time, why don't we use that as inspiration? Because we're we're hoping that, you know, we knew we we were going to have cross bracing. We knew we were going to have various types of connections within the building, and it was going to be occupied by by engineers, some of which are structural engineers. So why not use that as as an example of uh, you know and and a highlight within the building? And so this is kind of you know early early design imagery, kind of showing off that that structural look and and how we really wanted to use that as as a feature, and then have this you know really wrapping the the atrium in this colored structure and then having the second feature being the the stair and having that kind of wrap through the the atrium space which could then become a, a congregation space and really quite a quite an activated bright bright building especially when, when combined with with the skylight above and so this is one of the one of the images here kind of overlooking uh overlooking the atrium space here um, and I think we were quite successful in in achieving that look here. You know, really trying to minimize uh, any of the. You know, you can see sprinklers along the the existing building because that did need to have a one hour fire rating. But what we really wanted to do was embrace the fact that we were connecting to this existing building and make that make that a feature as well. So um, we cleaned up the the facade there. We added the fire protection that was required. Um, and really, uh, really look to not hide, you know, what what is quite an interesting facade on on the McKenzie building as well. And then in terms of uh, the remaining finishes, again, very, very muted color scheme, you know, floors kept to, to polished concrete because we knew they had to be hardy, they had to be uh, quite resilient. We didn't quite have the budget for epoxy. There was a discussion at one point to put in epoxy flooring, but the budget wasn't quite there. So we, you know, we kept it to, to polished concrete with uh, a future potential if, if needed for, for epoxy to be installed. Walls overall on, on level 200 and 300, concrete masonry units, uh, you know, painted white, and that any of the uh, door surrounds, any of the doors and things like that, just keeping it to uh, a couple of shades of, of gray with white ceilings so that they're kind of reflecting back. 
the light. And then for the feature stair, this was again, very much keeping it simple, light, but making this, you know, a very elegant piece within, within the atrium space. So putting in a glass guard, uh, a, a dark gray stair stringer that just kind of wraps up and around, integrated lighting uh, along the bottom with drywall finish to, to make that stair look quite light, stainless steel, thin handrails with a, a really kind of custom solution to be able to make that quite quite light and quite uh, quite sharp, we believe. You know, stainless steel, tactile indicators and all that good stuff. And I think, again, we were quite, uh, I, I believe we were quite successful in making this into uh, a, a great feature stair that, you know, in a in a building that's very, very structural, it's it's really this kind of floating floating element as it goes up. The light on the underside also, uh, you know, is, is dual purpose, kind of uh, gives it that, that brightness and, and, and a modern, very modern look while also lighting up the, the areas down below for when there's events and, and things like that. So this is the, the revised floor plan design. So as you can see, now we've kind of really reoriented the entryway into uh, that central, uh, central portion. So when you come in, you have you know direct access to the stair. As I mentioned, we closed off the entry to the McKenzie building. So this really meant that a lot more people were going to be using this entryway even if they were going to the McKenzie building. And so really there's there's kind of that that spine to the existing corridor as well as the pathway up to the upper levels up the feature stair and then the east west direction. We actually have an overhead door which you may have seen um, and that allows for for larger deliveries to those design bays to happen off the west side um, students can open that overhead door and they can actually bring in a vehicle uh, into the building. And actually in, in bay number four, when I was last there about a month ago, there was, there was uh, a couple of cars in there. So we're very happy that that's, that that's working well and, and successfully for the occupants. And then, you know, a lot of breakout spaces, informal spaces for people to, to be able to, uh, to meet, do homework, do, do other, uh, other activities and basically meet within those within those spaces the design bays and the design rooms themselves again very very simple finishes um within uh, the one major difference being that we we have a bit more uh soft ceilings within within the design rooms for for acoustic purposes and to make sure that that those aren't too echoey but then in the in the design bays uh themselves those uh typically don't have acoustic ceilings but there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of items within those spaces, but it avoids dust collection and and, and items that Carlton wanted to to avoid, kind of getting those areas dusty and and uh, dirty because they're meant to be rough and tumble workspaces. And so here you're you're actually seeing kind of a, a typical uh, lab space or a typical uh, design bay space. Um, here there's there's a couple of researchers. This is the elect electronics bay. And so what you really start to see here is is the amount of daylight that we're we're bringing in through through the large windows. Um, even though we don't have any south facing uh, south facing windows, we do end up getting a lot of a lot of uh, light into the building. Moving up to, to level 300 here, again, design room, you know, four design rooms along the, the east side with, with a breakout room in the center, and then two uh, design bays at the bottom there. And then uh, a larger, uh, Bay 8 is, is one of the larger bays, um, more breakout rooms, and kind of a, a central overlook into, into the, the main entry area. And so this is another, you know, another design bay on level 300. And again, what you're seeing here, this is north facing and, and really getting a lot of natural light into the building. Uh, you know, the rhythm of the structure really working well with, with the glass and, and, and the windows. And I think we're, we're very happy with what we, we were able to, to achieve in terms of coordination of the, the facade and the glazing and, and the structure. And I'm, I'm going to dive into that very, very soon. And so this is, this is the top level. So this is where, uh, the, the one major programmatic change during the, the expansion happened where we introduced a whole bunch of faculty offices, um, as well as this, this open office space here on, on the east side and meeting booths and meeting rooms kind of tucked away a little bit more, but we realized those didn't really need as much daylight. We talked about it with, with Carlton and they agreed that um, really what was critical was, was the faculty offices to get a lot of daylight there. So, and even these, these offices here that are flanking the, the atrium, uh, which, which you'll hopefully see on the, on the building tour are quite, uh, are quite nice. I'll just flip quickly here because I do realize we're, we're moving quickly 
quickly through through time. You know, these we ended up having to put up these privacy screens here, but as you can see, these these are fully you know landlocked offices, and they get a lot of daylight through through the atrium. So we're quite happy with with how that worked out as well. And then this is an example of the the elevator lobby here on the on the left. You know, large large expanse of glass overlooking what's right now Library Road with with some trees in the background, but what will be you know both a, a mix of the new building. Uh, and some revamped landscape in in the near future. And of course, just a couple of photos of the the staff lounge on on the right and the the open office area on the left hand side here. And so getting into the the facade of the building, this was a very, very interesting uh, process. And, and I, I think we went through a lot kind of a lot of detailing work to make sure that this, you know, we got the the facade rhythm working really well and and I hope you guys are, are able to take a closer look when when you're outside today so you know there there were challenges um in terms of connecting to an existing 1960s building obviously Carlton was interested in in making this addition as high performing as we could realizing that you know we were connecting to to uh, a rather old building that that you know doesn't have a lot of air tightness control uh, you know it's uh admittedly almost no air tightness control and so there was also a, a lot of seismic movement differences between our building being in steel and the existing building being in concrete, although a steel building was stipulated within the, the design brief. So we, we talked about switching to concrete for a little while, but really the preference was to go with, with a steel building. So we had to manage that with, with our seismic movement because, you know, at, at the ground level, there was, uh, you know, very, very little movement, about 50 millimeters. But once we got up to the top level, we had to account for 150 millimeters of movement. So in our fire separation, we actually had to have our expansion joints be able to move up to 300 300 millimeters because it needed to move in, in both directions. And then of course, daylighting, which I, I had mentioned before, a majority of our building faces north. So obviously great, consistent daylighting, but we, you know, we didn't have uh, very much direct uh, southern light with the exception of the atrium. So we had to really focus on getting a, a good amount of glazing on the facade without compromising the performance of the building. And, you know, our office and, and I think all of us as an industry, you know, we were aware that we we really need to be reducing our, our energy usage as much as possible in, in new buildings and when we build them. And so, you know, we, we always go back to, to this idea that, you know, the easiest way to address that is through passive design, right? So if you can, you can build a good building envelope, that's the way to really address the energy, uh, energy needs at the, the easiest level, and then getting into mechanical systems and, and improving those and making sure those are efficient. And then of course, there's there's connection to low carbon energy and, and PVs and, and, and all of those strategies. So at the baseline level, we really want to make sure that that what we were designing was was really good and robust from, from a, a passive uh, design level. So on the right hand side, you, you see that you, UI targets by typology that are sort of a good benchmark you know, we, we've been doing some research internally in our office, and these, these are kind of good benchmarks for building types. But these are obviously for new buildings where you can control the entire envelope. Ours was was uh, definitely not that. So we, we could only control the parts that we were building. And so for OBC compliance, actually, the building could have reached an EUI of 228. Um, but that's obviously not where where we wanted to land with the building, and that's not where Carlton wanted to go with the building. So we, you know, footprint footprint SA were were our uh, energy consultants on the project, and we were actually able to to reduce our energy to uh, an EUI of of one sixty five, which is a twenty eight percent reduction over over code minimum and the and the reference building. And a lot of that has to do with how we detailed the envelope. The systems definitely did did a lot of a lot of work towards that as well. But a big part of it was our high performance envelope. You know, a big part of it being the glass curtain system that we were able to use. And so we use the what's now formerly called the the Therm One Three Four, which is the the fire rated fiberglass curtain wall system. And that was one of our one of our uh, energy conservation me measures that we proposed. We had about ten. Um, that we had priced, um, and those included, uh, you know, uh, more high performance mechanical systems, fiberglass curtain wall, proved thermal performance, among among several others, um, to bring down our uh, our energy consumption on the project. And a lot of them were were picked up by by Carlton. So then I'm going to tie that together with how we work through the the architectural expression of the facade. So. We had the the existing condition, which is the the red brick and the and the painted concrete 
beams that ran horizontally. And then what we wanted to introduce was that patterning of, of a semi-reflective finish and a high reflective finish with you know large expanses of clear glazing and then a, a light textured precast panel um, in, in areas uh, along the ground where, where it needed to be a, a bit more robust. We ended up moving away from the, the purely reflective finishes to a more metallic coating. Um, a lot of that had to do with, with cost and, and price escalation, but I think we, we were still able to maintain kind of the, the idea and the vision of, of what we really wanted to achieve. And so when we look at the, the north facade here as a, as a diagram, what we wanted to do was, you know, that bottom level, was going to be all precast with large expanses of glass, really making sure that we were able to kind of bring in a lot of daylighting into that ground level, which was also taller than, than any of the above floors. And then when we got up to, to the second and third floors, um, that's where, where we maintain this, this rhythm. But then we started to, to really want to, to play around with this idea of um, this panelization that almost looks like I-beams kind of stacked one way and another to kind of build up this, this structure. Um, that makes up the facade. So what we then studied was how we could actually divide up these panels. So one of the first things we we established, um, we reached out to to Glassburn and we because we knew we we wanted to go with them. They they were the only manufacturer of, of fire rated uh, fiberglass curtain wall at that at that moment. And so you know we reached out to them. Carlton was okay with us doing that as 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 a single source. And so that's where where we we established the size of the glass. And then we started to look at the panelization. We worked with Sobotech for, for uh, the panel design. Um, and so what we, what we were able to establish is both the panels and the, and the glass size. Um, in terms of the panels, um, Flynn ended up, ended up uh, winning the contract for the, the panels themselves. And the precast was by, by Res. Um, but really, it was, it was a process where everybody kind of worked together to, uh, to find the right panel sizes and make sure that we were able to, to maintain this language uh, around, around the facade. And so when we extrapolate that to the full, to the full building, um, what we end up having is this very, very regimented kind of strict structure to it and, and nice rhythm. But it really, it really adds something quite resolved to it that, that it's, you know, working in, in such, a, such a perfect rhythm across the facade. Um, and it was usually sort of a, a, a one, two, three rhythm. So we had three, three widths that we worked with and that, and that allowed us to kind of work with uh, both the, the structural layout, the room layouts, as well as the, the facade. And so here, what we're seeing is the, the facade patterning and the panelization. And again, these, these vertical elements, as well as the horizontal elements and how these kind of work. So again, uh, we, we looked at the, the semi-reflective um, finish being the horizontal banding, because it would look uh, a bit lighter and, and tie into the banding along uh, Mackenzie. And then the highly reflective, that was going to tie into the glass. And we ended up going with, with a tone that's a little bit darker to mimic uh, kind of the darker tone of, of the Mackenzie building. And then the glass, you know, clear, clear glass with bird frit, uh, bird friendly frit on it, which is a requirement both by Carlton and now more recently by uh, the city of Ottawa. And so to get into some of the detailing and the, and the construction, um, so really what we wanted to do was make sure that we had a really robust thermal envelope in the way we, we detailed it, um, not allowing for thermal bridges, not allowing to, to make sure that, that our uh, insulation line was really uh, quite, quite uh, consistent. Um, and this kind of coming out of passive house principles. Um, so it's not a passive house building by, by any measure, but we did want to use those principles to make sure that we were really building the best envelope and using the best the best practices. So starting off with with the glazing here, that was projected out on um, on outriggers to to kind of get the the window out into the insulation plane, and then tying in our, our air and vapor barriers into uh, directly into uh, the curtain wall curtain wall glass there. And then next, of course, was was the insulation layer. So as you can see that fully lines up with where, where the line of the glass is and with the framing and then the insulation um, layer there. And then you can, you know, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see how that kind of assembled during, during the construction period. Um, and then finally the flashing and the metal panel detailing, um, which we worked both with, with glass curtain, as well as with Flynn to, to, you know, figure out all of those details we had, you know, this is actually a photo from the mock-up. Uh, early on in 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 the installation, and really uh, kind of driving that idea all the way through, and making sure that that all the panel seams were lined up and everything, because obviously you know when your glazing is is uh, being put in, 
that needs a little bit of tolerance. The metal panels need a little bit of tolerance, but we really, you know, work together as a team to make sure that everything was, was aligned. And I'll, that'll, that'll come up in one of the photos. So here's the metal panel. Here's another couple of photos from the, the construction phase as the, the insulation's going up and the windows are already in, in place. And again, this is kind of the, the construction uh, interior view. And then, of course, this is the same space as uh, you know, finished finished product here. And so, again, we we really work hard to uh, kind of have this have this patterning work out. And I think we were we were quite successful in that. Um, I think it, it worked out quite well. Um, and I think everybody's efforts were were really uh, integral to making to making that happen. And so, this is you know a final view along the front, um, really showing where the precast, the metal panel, and the windows all form together to really, really create this quite seamless and well, well put together pattern that, uh, that worked out quite well. With that, I'll, I'll say thank you and, uh, and thank you.